The Colossus of Rhodes stands as one of the most iconic statues of history and has inspired many artists across the ages. Yet much of this wonder of the ancient world is shrouded in mystery. Today, let us dive into its incredible story starting from its original forging from the remains of a massive war machine to its eventual collapse at the hands of a destructive earthquake. You can explore more of antiquity through our sponsor, Imperator Rome. The game just released a new Heirs of Alexander content pack, which puts you in the hot seat for the scramble to claim a piece of the Great Conqueror's splintering empire. Included in the pack are new Legion distinctions, unique mission trees for the Daidoki, new events, new deities, new treasures, and new music. But perhaps best of all is the inclusion of a wonder designer that allows players to build their own custom monuments, adding bonuses to their location or to the entire empire. Honestly, there's been a ton of content added to Imperator Rome since launch, which makes it a steal to pick up on sale today. Do so and support the channel by clicking the link in the description below. Enjoy! The island of Rhodes was located at a key location along the vital trade routes of the Mediterranean. Early on, its inhabitants had formed a series of settlements, which were of some note throughout the Bronze Age, Archaic, and Classical periods. For instance, it was said to have participated in the affairs of the mythic Trojan War and the later Greco-Persian Wars. However, the island was never a superpower and was prone to invasion from its more dominant neighbors who often squabbled for control of the territories across the Aegean. Thus in 408 BC, the cities of Rhodes united to form one territory so as to bolster their economic and military standing. As a part of these plans, they also founded a new capital city called Rhodes. Built with regular planning, five harbors, and impressive fortifications, it quickly developed into a maritime, commercial, and cultural center. Yet its success would draw envious eyes. In the ensuing years, Rhodes would fall subject to the Persians in the 350s and 340s BC until Alexander the Great arrived to establish a Macedonian garrison in 332 BC. The ensuing years were quite prosperous for the island city, which made the most of the blossoming trade which followed in the wake of Alexander's conquests. Yet when the great king died and his empire splintered between various successors, Rhodes was left in a tricky spot. The island initially tried to maintain its neutrality but became caught up in the larger machinations of the Diadochi. For example, when the Rhodians formed an alliance with Ptolemy I, they immediately drew the ire of his opponent Antigonus. He feared that Rhodes might supply ships to the Egyptians, or worse yet, allow them to use their island as a base of operations from which to assault Anatolia. Thus, in 305 BC, Antigonus sent his son Demetrius to take the city for himself. Demetrius reportedly set out with 200 warships, 150 support craft, and an army of some 40,000 soldiers. Smelling blood in the water, many local pirates were also drawn to the cause, and we are told that hundreds of vessels followed eagerly behind the fleet to feast upon the plunders that awaited the fall of the city. Yet Rhodes would be no easy prey. It too boasted a formidable fleet and had spent years reinforcing its fortifications. The operation began with Demetrius landing and setting up camp in the plains to the southwest of the city, while his ships began to blockade the harbor, sealing in the roughly 10,000 armed defenders. Meanwhile, Demetrius unleashed raiders on the rest of the unprotected island. The siege itself kicked off with a quite bloody exchange. Demetrius launched repeated amphibious assaults against the harbor, featuring numerous vessels and even a series of ship-mounted siege towers armed with artillery. At the same time, land forces attempted to storm the outer walls with ladders. The Rhodians were heavily battered, but managed to withstand the assaults. The siege would thus drag on for many long months, with the attackers failing to make any significant headway. In the beginning of 304 BC, Demetrius decided to change tactics and focus his efforts on a determined land assault. This would be carried out by constructing a massive siege tower, known simply as the Helepolis. As we discussed in a previous episode, these sorts of war engines were built as elevated weapons platforms to suppress defenders and allow the walls to be breached. This one in particular was among the largest of its kind. We are told that it was designed by the famous engineer Epimachus, who had quite the experience in these matters. His plans called for a nine-story tower with twin stairwells that stood around 40 meters tall. The giant structure was mounted on eight wheels, while its exterior was covered with padded rawhides to absorb projectiles and iron sheets to prevent incendiaries. The whole thing was then filled with all manner of artillery pieces and a complement of ranged troops. As one might imagine, such a behemoth was incredibly heavy. It was reportedly hauled forward by use of block tackles and ropes operated by several teams of men and oxen. Slowly, inevitably, it advanced on the city walls. 
The Rhodians feared that the tower would bring about the doom of their city. They thus brought their artillery to bear against it, but only managed to knock off a few of its iron scales. Bowing to the inevitability of its success, the Rhodians actually decided to abandon the first wall to its fate and build a second wall inside the city just behind where the tower was headed. In this way, when the Helepolis finally managed to crack the fortifications and the soldiers of Demetrius poured through the breach, they were met with the depressing sight of yet another ring of defenses. The attackers retreated for now, but soon launched a daring follow-up night assault. It managed to overcome the hastily erected inner wall. Fighting now raged inside the city as Demetrius pushed all the way to the theater. Yet the Rhodians fought so zealously that they were able to halt and finally repel the incursion. Shortly thereafter, Demetrius was recalled by his father and forced to abandon the more than year-long siege. The Rhodians were overjoyed. They had faced one of the premier superpowers of the age and emerged victorious. Truly, this was their finest hour. In celebration, they would decide to build a massive statue to their patron deity, the sun god Helios. Its construction would be funded by the city's vast economic profits, in addition to the cash generated by selling off the siege equipment they had captured from Demetrius upon his hasty retreat. Construction would begin around 292 BC and would take at least 12 years to complete. Our sources describe the statue as being a colossal, bronze depiction of a standing Helios which rose an estimated 33 meters tall upon a stone podium. The base of the statue carried the following inscription, preserved in the ancient anthology of poetry, the Palatine Anthology. Quote, to you, Helios, yes to you, the people of Dorian Rhodes raised this colossus high up to the heaven, after they had calmed the bronze wave of war and crowned their country with spoils won from the enemy, not only over the sea, but also on land, they set up the bright light of unfettered freedom. Beyond this, we know very little, as most of our sources provide only brief, sometimes conflicting commentaries written after its destruction. Pliny, for example, writes, quote, This statue was thrown down by an earthquake 56 years after it was erected. Few men can clasp the thumb in their arms, and its fingers are larger than most statues. When the limbs are broken asunder, vast caverns are seen yawning in the interior. Within it, too, are to be seen large masses of rock, by whose weight the artist steadied it while in the process of erection. It is said that it was 12 years in the making, and that 300 talents were spent upon it, a sum raised from the engines of war abandoned by Demetrius after his feudal siege. Perhaps the best information comes from Philo of Byzantium, who coined the whole Seven Wonders list and saw the wreck of the Colossus in 150 BC. He left us a rough description of its construction process, which has since been further refined by the studies of modern researchers. Here is one such proposed method of fabrication. Step 1. A base platform of stone is prepared some 20 meters across and 5 meters tall with an exterior marble layer. Step 2. Large iron bars are set across the base structure and converge near the center where they turn upwards at the position of the feet and proceed vertically. Step 3. Heavy feet of stone blocks are added up to the ankles and coated with hammered sheets of bronze. Step 4. The remaining statue is built up using rings of cast bronze plates broken up into smaller sections. Each of these would have been molded and customized off-site to meet the specific needs of the statue. They would then be lifted into place using the interior iron bars as structural support and joined together with rivets and clamps. As the structure grew, an external support system such as a mound of earth would have been added around the statue for additional reinforcement and to provide easier access. Some have even posited that the old siege towers could even have been used for the project. When the final, smallest sections were added at the end of the 12 years, the whole support structure was removed and the Colossus revealed. Unfortunately, we don't actually know much about what the statue looked like, nor where it was even located. One suggestion, popularized in the medieval period by people such as Shakespeare, is that it stood gallantly astride the inner harbor entrance of Rhodes, with ships passing between its legs. However, this idea has largely been discredited. Such a pose would have been structurally unstable, difficult to build, and perhaps most importantly, would have blocked a critical port entrance for over a decade during construction. It's for this reason that most historians place it somewhere near the harbor entrance. Still impressive, but nowhere near as inconvenient. Regarding its appearance, we also don't know much for sure, as we have no surviving depictions of the Colossus in other art. Some believe the statue to have been draped in a cloth, semi-nude, or fully nude. All forms have precedent in other architecture of the period. 
we might get some clues from common silver coins from Rhodes at the time that do show a sun god Helios with the crown bearing pointed sunbeams, while another relief from a local temple shows the same deity shading his eyes with one hand. Unfortunately, however, many details will be lost forever to history, as the ancient wonder was destroyed by an earthquake around 228 BC, just 56 years after it had been built. Some Rhodians wished to salvage the precious structure, but were ultimately warned against it by the Oracle of Delphi, who prophesied that moving it would bring misfortune upon the city. Thus, the remains of the Colossus of Rhodes would lay in the water for centuries, withering away or eventually being scavenged for other construction projects. One fanciful story from the medieval period claims that a merchant collected the scraps, melted them down, and had them transported away, but this is not widely regarded as credible. In any case, I hope you've appreciated this look into the history of the Colossus of Rhodes. Stay tuned for more episodes on ancient history, and be sure to check out Imperator Rome's latest update where you can build your own wonders of antiquity. See you in the next one.